Welcome everyone. I'm Brian Hurley. I have an office here in Hatch and I run a consulting company called Business Performance Improvement. And so, uh, how many of you have been to Hatch before this building? Okay. Half of you? Okay, I'll talk about them briefly a little bit. Um, so this is the Six Sigma Primer. So we're just going to go through a lot of different concepts around Six Sigma so you have a better idea what that means. And then we'll go through specific tools and examples things I've worked on, and then try to figure out how does this fit into the type of work you do. So we'll do some introductions and get to know each other a little bit. And then also I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about talking about what are the apl applications that you might have. So I want you to leave here with a couple ideas of, of things you could do in your own work or in your job or maybe even at home that makes sense and ties back into Six Sigma a little bit. So uh, first couple of things, so uh, just let me know when you're done, just leave your glasses up here and we'll uh, take care of those. Is anyone, if you need any water or coffee, there's some in the kitchen over there. So we'll have a, a couple exercises, we'll have a little bit of time to grab a break or, or whatnot. Restrooms are right out here, if you found those. And then exits would be um, straight out to the side, there's lots of entrances, exits out the front here, and then out to the side here as well. Um, one of the groups that I work with is called Lean Portland, and what they are is a volunteer group of businesses that get together and, and work with nonprofits to try to help them with process improvement work. And so um, if you have some background or know somebody who might be interested in helping with some of that work, please get them in touch with me, and we're always looking for more volunteers. We're also looking for people who just are new to process improvement work with Lean or Six Sigma concepts and want to get some more hands-on experience. We welcome people like that as well because we can work with them and give them some more experience. Maybe they're not giving an opportunity at, at their work to do that. So we kind of have a mix of, of different skill levels that we uh, work with. Just to have a passion for helping people, that's all we need. Uh, this is my organization. Um, I'm really kind of focusing around organizations that are working towards the triple bottom line around sustainability. So it's not just here we're here to make money or, or save mm -hmm. dollars, but what can we do for the environment or for our community as well. And then Hatch is a nonprofit for social entrepreneurship. So a lot of people are starting their businesses or they run a nonprofit out of this uh, co-working space. Um, they also do a lot of work trying to get capital and raise money from individuals instead of trying to get large do donors and funders in the state of Oregon. So they've gotten some laws passed that allow individuals to contribute to businesses and kind of invest in them, try to keep the money local. So they have a lot of good stuff going on. You can check them out there. But this is a co-working space out here. And about a year ago, I started working out here and then kind of slowly gravitated to an office in here. So really cool space if you haven't been here. But you can come in and get day passes if you're interested in just getting a place where you have a lot less distract distractions and or just want a different change in scenery. This is what we're going to cover today. So there's quite a few things on here. So we won't be able to deep dive into a lot of the tools, but I want to give you enough knowledge on them to say, oh, that sounds like something I might be interested in learning more on, or um, yeah, I can see applicability, or well, that's maybe too advanced where we're at right now. Um, but I want to try to introduce you at least to the more common tools that you might not have seen or maybe heard a little bit about. Hello. Hello. So in 10 seconds, let's go around the room and let's find out a little bit about you. So give me your name, your company, and then what your position is, and then what made you come to this workshop? What were you hoping to learn today? So nothing real elaborate, just something quick. You wanna start? Talk. Sure, my name is Momoko. Um, the company is Bike Town. Um, okay. Operations director, uh, and I'm here just to constantly educate myself on different techniques. Okay, great, thanks. Nisi from Bike Town. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a technician and hoping to just learn some new tools to apply at work. Okay. What kind of, are you working on the bikes themselves? Mm -hmm. Okay. They get a little wear and tear, I guess? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Which is good. Yeah. Okay. Desi, uh, also by town, also okay. by technician. Okay. Um, I'm here to, I would just like to learn new tools, get better at my job. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is James. I'm also with Bike Town. Um, uh, I'm the lead bike technician. Uh, and yeah, just interested in how we might be able to incorporate some of these concepts into our operation. Okay. Great. I'm Brenda Sachs. 
Sutton and I work for the Standard as an internal consultant uh, doing learning and development solutions, project management, process improvement, um, and, and leadership work. Okay. So I'm just interested in how this can bring a twist when I'm looking at processes and learning development solutions um, to my job and the toolkit. Great. Okay. My name is Elsa Norman. Um, I'm just here to learn more about the <laughs> Okay. That's good. Uh, let's go back over here. My name is Dree. Uh, my company is Alte Alpha, uh, where we trade books in Nash uh, I'm okay. the founder and CEO, and I, uh, I want to learn six weeks more, and I want to check cash now. Okay. I'm Isaac, and I'm a consultant with North Highland, uh, and I'm here uh, to just kind of further my education. Um, been to some of the previous workshops, and, and interested in the, the the Six Sigma piece of the lean. Okay, great. My name's Scott. Uh, I'm a kind of do independent consulting. Um, been to a couple of the same uh, Six Sigma workshops and lean, just trying to uh, refresh my skills. I used to do it a long time ago, um, okay. and then also just interested in how it works with uh, sustainability and triple bottom line. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. I'm Kyle. Um, I'm an operations coordinator for a company called Eagle Service, and I'm just here to just, just learn. You can, yes, you're right. Uh, first and foremost, apologies for coming in. We had some training today. Um, but my name is Alex. I'm with um, Organizers for the West, Janine, Jamie, and Dan, and thanks as well for all the same team. Yeah. see it. Um, and we are all interested. We're all professional organizers. So we want to organize their homes and lives and offices. And um, we are interested in learning more about Six Sigma in general. And to our business and help our clients. Okay. Anything you guys want to add? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very efficient, Alex. Um, good timing. Yeah, perfect. Just in time. Um, so my name's Wayne. I own uh, and operate Periodic Edibles. Um, the owner. I pretty much right now focus on business development and marketing um, and operations as well. And here to learn more and more about lean. We have a food manufacturing business, so you know, improving those operations, efficiencies, waste streams, like we're just kind of getting into lean, reading some books and these workshops are adding on top of that. Okay, awesome, perfect. And you're just in time. Introductions. Answer these questions and... Okay, yeah. I'm Sarah McKnight, and I'm looking for a position, but I have a side hustle doing project and management um, answer question answers and uh, I am a project manager in technology and, uh, primarily in software development but in the healthcare and the financial services industry and I'm here because I was involved with Lean 10-15 years ago and I recently heard that there's a resurgence of interest in it and I wanted to find out what that was all about. Excellent. Hello. First you an introduction. You are you're up you know, just in time. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Tui, my name is Tui too. I have my own firm. <coughs> and um, I'm just interested in what this is all about. Okay. I um, I have an engineering background, I do transportation planning. Most of my work has been in planning and also resiliency. So I just got done teaching a uh, course at the University of Portland on planning for the next big earthquake. So, always ready to, for the next big thing. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty big thing. Yeah. So, how many of you would uh, say you have some knowledge of Six Sigma coming into today? A little bit? Mm -hmm. About how many of you would say, I have no knowledge what this is? Perfect. You're all in the right spot. So, we'll go through some, some basics and then we'll deep dive in a couple things. So hopefully everyone will find some value here today. And if we have questions, please raise your hand and ask. 
Yes. Are First you gonna, question. I know. Are you going to talk <laughs> about how it's related to lean? I will. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up at the end with that discussion. So hopefully Perfect. I have enough time to um, have a little bit more detailed discussion on that. I've got my philosophy and thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. Because that is a very common question. Um, there's lean and six sigma. How do they relate to each other? So a little history, um, if you've been to the Lean workshops, um, you have a very similar slide to this. Except there's only one person in common with the Lean methodology in this particular slide. Does anyone know who might be standing out if you've been to other classes, other workshops? Deming. Dr. Deming, yeah. Have you guys heard of Edward Deming? Edwards Deming? He, um, was a, he was working on the census after World War II, and he went over to Japan to start helping them kind of assess what's going on and help them rebuild a little bit. And he started putting on these workshops around <coughs> quality and, and data analysis, and it really resonated with a lot of the Japanese companies there. And from that effort, he got a lot of momentum with the companies on taking some of the best techniques that were used in World War II here in the US and expanding those out. And so he got a lot of momentum, and that really drove a culture of quality, which is really at the heart of both of these. If you, get it, if you do things right the first time with consistency and minimal variation, you're going to have good results. And that sp spun off from their lean and, and Six Sigma activities. Um, but they're a little bit different. We'll talk about the differences there. But it all came from really the father of SPC, which is statistical process control. And his name is Walter Schu Schuhart. He also came up with a model called Plan Do Check Act. If you've seen that or heard of that before. It's kind of an iterative loop that says, I'm going to plan out what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually do it, and then I'm going to actually check to see if it worked. And I need some data to be able to do that. I can't just say, oh, it feels like it's running better. What do the numbers say? And then what am I going to do as a result of that? If it got better, great. Should I continue that? Should I roll it out further? If it didn't get better, why not? What can I learn from that? So a very simple model of improvement that really took off and is still utilized today. Plan, do, check. Act. Act. There's also Plan Do Study Act and um, other variations of that, but he was the one who kind of came up with that core model. So that's, a, that's at the heart of Lean as well. So Deming, Deming was a big proponent of Schuhart and studied a lot of his work and really kind of helped communicate that out to the Japanese. And a lot of Schuhart's work was uh, pivotal in a lot of the World War II assembly lines, uh, especially as they were transforming over and building aircraft to military craft. And, uh, machinery to weapons and and uh, supplies and and things like that. The amount of production they were able to achieve was a, a largely a result of a lot of these quality techniques. Um, so then this got materialized by Bill Smith, who worked at Motorola, and still trying to trace back where he came up with all these things. But there's a history of these tools that have been around for a while that he kind of packaged together. So it used to be kind of listed under a total, total quality management program. He said, this is really difficult for people to figure out what to do, what the next steps are. So he said, what if we package this up into a program where there's a methodology and these tools fit into the steps? And we'll talk about that step here, but he's the one that's really the one who came up with a Six Sigma term. So we'll explain that a little bit more. And then Jack Welch was the CEO of General Electric. And in the early to mid 1990s, he took over and he learned a lot about what Motorola have done, had done. And he said, I like that. And I think that's something I want to do at General Electric. And what he imposed was, my management team needs to understand these concepts. I can't just assign it to the engineers or I can't just assign it to our workers. My management needs to make decisions that have these concepts in mind. And so he said, if you want to move up in GE, you need to be at a green belt level of knowledge around Six Sigma. And that got a lot of momentum because that's what they um, were striving for, is people wanted to move up and do better in the company. So he set that expectation that you need to understand these tools. So we'll talk a little bit more about the belt system and things like that, but that's just a little bit of history of how the Six Sigma initiative took off in, in about the same time as the Lean programs. And the success around Six Sigma is really around the captured cost savings, that they were able to quantify a lot of the savings. And that's, really uh, eye-opening some of the dollar savings, and that got a lot of attention from management and companies. But it was, it was really kind of an um, a American uh, concept that kind of got built up, whereas the lean had kind of started as Japanese taking some of the American ideas as well. So it doesn't matter, so one of the core things around Six Sigma is around variation. And 
how consistent are the results we're getting? So if you look at these oranges, do you see any variation in the color and the maturity or ripeness of the oranges, right? Yeah, so there's different shades, different colors to it. So not everything is equal, they're all oranges, but they have different levels of quality. And at some point we would say, there's a certain amount of variation I'm willing to accept, and then there's a certain amount of variation I'm not willing to accept. So where, where would you draw the line if you were looking at this in the, in the grocery shelves? Where would you say your cutoff criteria would be? I would you would take, take a day, day five one? Five and seven would be the ones I would take. Which ones? Five and seven. Five and seven, you like those two? Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? And nine looks pretty good. You like nine? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Four to eight range, probably. Four to eight days, somewhere in there? Okay. <clears throat> That's good. Anyone else? That's a great question, right? Well, it depends. Depends on the customer. Depends on how grant, how detailed they want to get into those requirements. But at some point, um, we we do put some kind of criteria around this that says there is some level of of quality that I'm willing to to accept, and there's other that I'm not quite ready to accept, or I'm not willing to pay the full price for, or I don't value as much. And so. The concept is that variation doesn't make a difference. It's not just a black and white that this is a good orange and this is a bad orange. It's, there's a gray area there. And trying to figure out where those cutoff lines are is, is a little tricky. And we heard a little bit different answers from different people. And so what is that criteria is part of that discussion we would go through with Six Sigma. What does the customer want? What are they willing to accept? What is acceptable for them? So there's a lot of discussion that takes place with that. We spent a lot, of, a lot of time talking about what are the requirements and where do we come, where do those get derived from? We also talked about this isn't black and white. So if it's day seven and then it's maybe this is day eight right on the line, was that a good or a bad? Well, it's kind of borderline maybe in this scenario. So it's not just uh, an easy decision to make right there, especially as we get close to the edge where it's a little gray. And so what um, some of the concept was is that if you look at this, this is kind of a dissatisfaction curve. And the idea is that when you're right in the middle, a lot of people can agree that this is a good looking orange. A lot of different customers would accept that. So the level of dissatisfaction is very low. But as you get closer and closer to these limits and further away from the center or the ideal, you start to incur, incur some dissatisfaction. And maybe it's still in the tolerance range, but it doesn't mean your customers are always happy just because it's in the tolerance range. They might grab it and they might pay for it, but it doesn't mean they're 100% satisfied. They'd rather have this one, but this was available, so it's good enough, I'll take it. But we, we often think this is a black and white answer. And what we learned in Six Sigma is it's a gray thing, and you start, the further you get away from the perfection, you start to incur some dissatisfaction from your customers. So they might, you might have a requirement that says, we give our customers three day turnaround time on proposals or, or work that we do and you give it to them at 2.9 days, and you say, hey, we met the requirement, it doesn't mean the customer is 100% satisfied. They really wanted it yesterday. Yes, they, you agreed to three days, and they'll accept it under three days, but it doesn't mean that they're satisfied with that. So we have to look at variability because it does make a difference. And that's the idea is that it, it's a little bit more difficult than just, is it in spec or is it acceptable per the terms we have with our customer or not? And so the goal is how do we make our products and services ideal and perfect all the time? And we're never gonna get there, but we're gonna strive to get there, and that's really the goal. So I use this analogy with, with golfing. Um, so let's look at this real quick. I have a video, but I'm gonna show you the, the, the detailed slides so you can go back and reference it. And I talked about that. So in golf, I have some requirements. Let's say I'm gonna tee off and I'm gonna to try to figure out how do I stay out, away from those sand traps. So I have a requirement, I need to hit it at least 150 yards, but I can't hit 250 yards. Or I'm gonna risk the chance that the ball is gonna go in the sand traps, right? 
And so in Six Sigma, we use this, we look at the variability of the results and say, this is how good of a Sigma performance we are. And it's the higher number you get, the better. And you try to get to Six Sigma is really the goal. Well, we first need to figure out, well, how good are we doing today? So if I key off and I land it right there, that's pretty good, right in the middle. That's one sample. I do it again. That one was 220. The next one goes to 200. Pretty good, right in the middle. Not, not, and nowhere near the sand trap. This one, oops, went a little farther. So I didn't land in the sand trap, but I almost did. So we might say that was a bad shot. The fourth one, teed off. Oh, I actually landed in the sand trap. Not a good, <coughs> not a good result. I fell short of the, the target. And the fifth one, it's inside the requirements, but it just barely skipped past that. So I was a little too close, but it's acceptable. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to stay in this middle area as much as possible, stay furthest away from any points where we have to make a, a tough call about what is good or what's bad. And so if my process, if I tee off 20, 30 times in a row, and that's the spread of my process and where I land the ball, would you say that's a good result or a bad result? Bad. If you're staying within the 150 to 250 yard range. Not very good, right? You're all over the place. That's probably what mine look, would look like if I did. And that would be considered a one sigma process where 30% of the time I'm, in, I'm inside the right range and 70% of the time I'm outside the range. This would be a two sigma process. You can see it got a little less variation, still exceeding the limits, but it wasn't as bad as the one sigma process. There's a three sigma process. Getting a little better, more consistent, still have a few outside there, but really close. There's a four sigma process, you get the hang of this. Five sigma process and a six sigma process. So you can see as I start to get more consistency in my results and I stay away from these gray areas of our requirements from our customer, I start to get much better performance where I'm at 99 some percent success rate of that process. And now I feel really comfortable when I tee off, if I have a Six Sigma process, I know exactly where that ball is going to land. Now it takes a long time and a lot of work to get to that point, but that's the idea. So we're trying to get up to a point where we have consistent results to our customers and they can start to trust that they're gonna get exactly what they, we told them we would provide to them. But we have to measure these things as well. Is there any questions about that concept? Yeah. I'm the, I've seen this one before with golf. And okay. I'm just curious about it because I, I get that, you know, for the Six Sigma you wanna be like in the middle of that, but for golf it's also about distance too. Yeah. So wouldn't it be better if that grouping was like a lot tighter but closer the, so you might want to be closer up here? You say? Yeah, so or is that better? because there's a chance that you could go over, and so that's more like the danger zone? You know what I mean? Just yep. with the golf example, no. it's kind of interesting. No, that's a good way. So what you could do is you could say, here's how much I vary. Now, how close could I get without risking going over? Right. And you could probably go maybe another 20, 30 yards and adjust your swing a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so this would be assuming you're trying to land in the middle. Okay. But if you're trying to get as close to as possible, you have a little bit of room to move there. But in other, oops, in other processes here at four, three sigma, you wouldn't be able to move much. You start landing a lot more into the trap. So right, right. yeah, that's a good point. Sometimes your, your goal isn't to land right in the middle. It's to land as close to one or the other. That is better performance that way. So these sigma levels equate to success rates. And I showed, they showed up in the, in the data here, but this is really kind of the success rate or the yield of the process. And so as you increase, your sigma levels, your yield and success rate goes up. And what happens to your costs as a result of this, when you don't have to rework, when you don't have to do things over again, when you don't have to firefight, and you don't have to hurry around and quickly try to get something done because your process failed you. You spend less of your money in waste and inefficiency. So less of your sales dollars is going into paying extra labor and overtime and extra material costs and losing customers because of your performance. And so 
the goal is to try to get your sigma level higher and higher. And you do that by looking at one of the ways is to reduce the variability in your process. So we won't get into all the details on some of the calculations, but the main thing to know is two sigma is better than one sigma. And I've seen processes that are at zero sigma or negative sigma. And the goal is just, can we get better than where we're at today? We don't necessarily have to get to six sigma, but we want to move in that direction. So where would you guess, if you're looking at these percentages, where would you guess that your processes are today? Just purely based on the success rate of the process. Are you at 80% success? <coughs> or you might be somewhere in the two to two and a half sigma? Do you have 95% success, which might be between three and three and a half sigma? Are you at 99.99% .99 success rate? Or are you struggling kind of still down here in the 30 to 40% success rate? Ready to share that yet? Just depends <laughs> on what you're measuring. Are yeah. you just talking about measuring customer, uh, like. Could be customer <laughs> satisfaction. Yeah. Could be <clears throat> transactions that go through successfully. It could be, you know, customer support tickets that get answered in a timely manner. Um, yeah, all those are typical measures. Could be the, the response time for your own standards. Do you respond in a timely manner? However you measure success of your processes, how well are you doing against that? And that's kind of what we're thinking about with this sigma level, so. Does that make sense? And so these, are, these can be hard to calculate at first, but first thing we're gonna do is just get some data to look at that. And we're gonna follow, yes? Can I ask a quick question about the previous slide? Um, could you walk us through, or um, maybe we'll get to this eventually, but like the, how you get a um, less than 1% yield variation, but uh, then you can have up to up to 10% uh, cost of sales. Cost of sales, yeah. So that small percentage, it may be that you're in probably like in a higher volume situation that even though you're running a pretty high 99%, that 1%, you, cost, you spend a lot of money dealing with that 1%. It's the complaints, it's the follow-up, it's the extra work you have to put into it, it's the uh, reshipments of stuff, it's the replacement of things that um, those costs add up a lot. And if you're really too far down here at the low levels for a long time, you're gonna have a hard time making it if, if that's your success rate. So, you know, at some point you have to get to a point where it's, you're making money and doing well, but then everything else beyond that is, if you can get higher up, then you can start to chip away at some of those excess costs. A lot of people have a hard time quantifying their, their current amount of spend that they have for cost. And that's one of the things we would do in a project is try to figure out what is the cost when you have something go wrong? How much time are you spending on that? How much extra material do you have to spend? How much frustration is it to your employees? Um, all those things have a cost, so we can try to estimate some of those things. And people are pretty shocked when they start doing the math and say, oh, when I had to overnight that shipment, when I had to pay people overtime to, to fix it, when I had to reorder more materials, when I had to um, smooth things over with the customer and go visit them in person, that took me out the whole day. Those types of things, it starts to add up pretty quick. So yeah, it doesn't take very much to start chipping away at, at these. And these are just kind of rough estimates, but. So this process that we go through is, is called DMAIC. It's, it stands for define the problem, and that's a very, seems, seems very simple, but it's actually challenging. What is the exact problem we're trying to fix here? Yeah, we have issues, and we just have a lot of ideas, but let's really nail down this specific issue. We're having this complaint from these types of customers on these types of transactions, and it's happened over this time period. Can we all agree that that is a true problem? And that's one of the first steps. Second one is, well, where's the data that supports that? Do we have any data? All we do is have complaints, but we have no idea what's going on there. Sounds like we better go get some data and, and try to figure out what's happening. Then we get into analyze. And, and these slides will be provided to you guys too, so um, I'll email them out to you so you have that. Uh, so when we get into analyze, we're gonna figure out, well, why is it happening? So I know it's happening over here. 
on this type of product or in this service that we're providing or with these types of customers, but I'm not sure why it's happening. So we dig into that and figure out what is the root cause of the problem or what are the variabilities in the process that create that issue. And then let's make some improvements. So what we usually do is we, we might define the problem and then we jump to improvements, right? I got these ideas, let's go solve this, let's fix this, let's try this. And that works for some simple stuff, but usually when we get to this point, we've tried some simple stuff already. Now we need to go through and do a little bit more methodical approach to it. So we don't jump right to improve, we go get the data and we spend some time understanding why the things are happening. Then we can go make the right improvement and not just change a bunch of stuff and hope one of them fixes it. And then here's another key thing is we need to control the process going forward so that problem doesn't creep back in there in the future. So what are we going to monitor about the process? So we can start to pick up, hey, we're starting to trend up on our response times. What's going on here? Do we need to bring in more staff? Or is there a new problem creeping into our process we don't know about? So we need to have some things to keep, help us keep an eye on the process to make sure it's still going well. So that structure works really well. I use this a lot for almost all the activities I do, both Lean and Six Sigma. Is I first need to understand what are we trying to accomplish and what is the real problem we're trying to solve. And that, that's a little more difficult than it seems sometimes. Has anyone seen this or does that make sense, this model? I like it too because I can remember those, those five steps pretty well. <coughs> But it, this increases your chance of getting success on the project. And the downside is it takes a little bit longer than your normal effort. Because a lot of times we skip a lot of steps and we hope we get the right answer. So we're going to say, to do this right, we need to go back and do a couple extra steps, get the right data, do some analysis, work, talk to the people who are dealing with the issues, talk to our customers. Then we can come up with the right some improvement. But I bet you'll get a much better success rate when you go through that approach. And that's the goal, is successful improvements. And I mentioned data, and that is a lot of what Six Sigma is about, is, is getting the data and doing something with that information. And that's also something that scares people off. You know, I hated statistics in college, or I'm not very good with numbers, or yeah, I had a class one time, um, and yeah, I don't want everyone to use my calculator or spreadsheets anymore. Um, so hopefully there's some easier techniques we can show that aren't as scary and kind of get you into it. Um, I've taught all different <laughs> levels of skill of people. So even people that hate their math, hate um, <coughs> analysis and data, um, we can show some easier techniques. And we'll go through some simple stuff today. Hopefully it's not too scary. But it's a lot better if we have data than just jumping in and guessing or hoping we, we get the right improvements. Sometimes uh, we will get lucky, but it's not really a reliable way to do it. And we can also make sure that these improvements aren't just, we got lucky this week and it looks better, or this month was what good, and so that means we must have solved the problem. We could provide more uh, analysis and some more science behind, did it actually, was it actually a result of the things we improved or we just happened to get lucky that time? The data takes time to gather too especially if you don't have it. Sometimes you have it and you just haven't figured out a way to get it out of the system or uh, you have it all in sheets of paper and you gotta figure out how to get it into the spreadsheet. Other times it's, we have none of this detail and we're gonna have to start from scratch. So that can take a lot of time and effort, but when you do have that data, it's a lot easier to show what's going on and explain what's happening in the process. It also takes the emotion out of a lot of situations we're dealing with problems and issues, and people are frustrated. And so when we can stay focused on the numbers, what does the number say? You know, yes, it's very painful, but it only happens a couple times. This other problem happens 10 times a month. Maybe we should focus our attention on this first, then we'll come to this next problem. Or it seems like it's happening a lot, but when we actually look at it, you know, when we actually collect it up data, it doesn't happen as often as we think it does. Or vice versa, it happens way more than we realized. Holy cow, this is a lot worse than we thought. And some people say, well, you can do whatever you want with statistics. You can modify your data to make it say what you want. And you can make charts to make it look the way you want. And you're absolutely right. You can do that. 
Um, but at least we can go back and say, can you show me the data and let me make my own charts. And I'm not getting the same chart you got. And we can have a, a, a discussion around the data. If we don't have any data, then it's just our opinions. And that's really hard to have a, a meaningful conversation there. So at least it gives us a starting point. And if someone is manipulating or trying to show something that's not there, we can go back and look at it and challenge that. But you have to have good data because if you have garbage coming into it, you're going to get garbage going out of it as well. So that's another big thing around Six Sigma is, do we have good data? And let's make sure before we start trying to draw some conclusions and change our processes around, let's make sure we have the solid information. So I wanted to talk about a couple of different tools that are kind of the primary ones around Six Sigma. And these are statistical based tools, but I want to try to hopefully explain them in a way that are um, more simplistic than that. Has anyone heard of the first one called Gauge r and &R, or Gauge Repeatability and Reproducibility Studies? Okay, perfect. When you, when you have data, let's say it's um, a, a calculation of how many customers you had this month, or it's a report on how many issues there were this week. All those are measured values of some sort. And with every measured value, there is a, a real number and some amount of error caused by the way in which we're taking the measurement. And hopefully that measurement error is very small and very minor and it doesn't really affect our results. But we don't really know. We assume that that's small, but we haven't really proven that out either. We're trying to get to this. I want to know what the real number is. And all I get is a, a, a measured value. So what are some of the measurements you guys deal with in your, in your business? Rejects. <clears throat> Rejects, OK. So you're getting some, someone's categorizing maybe what happened or so type like of issue. Final product that falls outside the weight. Final weight. weight that we allow okay. if it's high or low when we discard it. So you get a certain weight mm -hmm. measurement. Mm -hmm. That is your measured value. You hope that that is the actual value, but there is measurement error. Could be how much knowledge and experience the person weighing it has. It could be how well that scale is working today. It could be what's going on in the room at the same time. It could be the temperature in the room that's affecting the results. It could be the, the technique that the person is using to take the measurement. And that's all part of measurement error. And so what we can do with gauge R&R &R is we can measure the measurement error. We can assess the measurement error and see, is this mudding up the results I'm getting? Or is it proving that I have a really good measurement system? And so we're trying to figure out how accurate, precise is this data that I'm collecting? Because if it's off and it's misleading, I'm going to go down the wrong path. Or I'm going to think it's helping and I'm really not going after the right thing. But if you get a measurement like, you know, 4.3 grams, it might be 4.1 grams plus 0.2 of measurement error. Or it could be 3.8 plus 0.5 measurement error. We don't know. And so this gauge r and is a way we can test for that. So it stands for repeatability and reproducibility. Repeatability is I have the same person measure the same thing over and over again. Nothing is changing. And so if I do it multiple times, theoretically, if I'm weighing that, what would I get for the answer? First time I get 4.2, what should I get the next time? 4.2. How about the third time? 4.2, hopefully, right? So let's check that out, see if that works. Wait, I got 4.2, then 3.8, then 4.5. Uh-oh. Now what's happening? I don't have a repeatable measurement on the same thing. That would be a repeatability problem. Reproducibility would be, I can get the same answer, but when I give it to my friend or my coworker, they do it, they get 3.8, 3.8, 3.7, 3.9, 3.8. So we're both consistent, repeatable, but we don't match each other's answers. 
That might be another issue. That's reproducibility. Can I reproduce the results of somebody else? Those two terms make sense? So the only way you can really measure this is you have to set up a little study, an experiment. And that's what a gauge study is, is a, a, an experiment to try this out. So let's say we're gonna take a smartphone and we're gonna check for repeatability. So I'd take that phone and I'd take a device and I'd measure it with the calipers and I'd get these readings and you can see that those are pretty close to each other. So you'd say, I feel pretty good that we have a repeatable process. But if this is my result over here, I'm starting to get a little concerned about how well can I trust this data if it jumps around that much every time I take a measurement of the same exact phone each time. And I see this more than you would imagine, that we can't repeat ourselves on the numbers. And that's a, that's a big problem. That creates a lot of confusion about what's actually going on in the process. Reproducibility would be, we have two people. They each take their own readings and they both average out the same number. They both came out on average with the same results. On um, this situation, you could see that these results differ. And one comes out here and one comes out over there. And they differ from each other. That would be they don't reproduce each other. So now who's right and what's going on there? It is creating variation into the data. And it's not even coming from the process that we're really trying to measure and look at. It's the way in which we're taking the data. So that was like the big aha thing that when I started learning about Six Sigma was, you mean the, the measurements can be part of the problem? And um, I've actually had projects, two projects that we fixed the measurements and the problem went away. It was how we were collecting the data that was the problem. And that was like mind blowing to me because it just seems, wow, this is a, it's a fancy piece of equipment. It's gotta be producing really good results. And it wasn't. And that, that happens more than you would think. So the first thing we wanna do is make sure we have good data and we can do an experiment like this to prove it out. So this is where we're taking, yes? Just curious, is, is there a, a rule of thumb or a range uh, that you would recommend for, yeah. for determining what you wanna be yeah, if you have like a, a, a range of values, you want to stay, you don't want your measurement error to be like more than 10% of that range. So if you're eating up 20, 30, 50% of the range just from your measurement variability, that's creating a lot of other problems. Yeah, so 10% is the rule of thumb that you want to be under. And that means it's just, it's, it's still a problem. You're not gonna get that to zero. There's always gonna be a little bit of variability in how people collect data, but you want it to be very minor in the big scheme of things. And this is for when we're taking measurements. After this little exercise, we're gonna go in and I'm gonna show you one where we're not taking measurements, but we're making categorizations or decisions mm -hmm. and how that can be part of the problem too. Okay, so I've got a handout here. Um, everyone at the table, can you partner up with the person next to you? Yeah, introduce yourself if you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And does everybody have a smartphone? Yeah. Or at least one person at the table have a smartphone with a stopwatch on it. Yes. Okay. Okay, so what we're gonna do is you're gonna partner up and you have one person go first. And the goal is to just say start, and then you're gonna tell the person who's timing you when to say stop, and you're trying to get them to stop at 10 seconds. Without looking at it? Without looking at, you can't look at it. So your partner is gonna time you. You just have to figure out your own technique to figure out 10 seconds. And you can't look at the clock behind you. You have to do it by memory or your own counting technique. But you're trying to, they're gonna say go, and you tell them when to say stop. And you don't get to see the answers. You get to do it six times in a row, and then we'll switch, and the other person gets to do six attempts. Does that make sense? So you'll have your names at the top here. You're going to write my scores. Yes. And, but you're also going to time. Yeah. Your, yeah. So you have to have the stopwatch to figure out what the exact time is. Yeah. So you tell me, when you say start, and then I say start. Uh, however you want to do it, just as long as you probably do it consistently. Ready, set, start. Ready, hit, go. Start. Eight, nine, ten, Okay, so I'm going to use my phone. Hold 
No, let me do that. Let me do that again. I'm ready. Stop. Start. So we have a master over here, right? Heard a, someone had an average of 10.3. Anyone else? Is it 10.24? Did anyone beat 10.24 for an average result? What was that? What are some of the averages you had? This is good. 9.1. 9.1. That's pretty good. I used bananas. What did you guys use? One banana, two bananas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I totally missed that. 9.76. Ooh, nice. Anyone can beat those? Who got the worst one? What'd you get? 12.5. 12.5. <laughs> oh, that's worse. <laughs> Anyone beat that one? <laughs> So you had some, you're off, so there's two problems that you're, you're encountering, right? You've got, you're, you're misaligned, you're not calibrated to 10 seconds on average, right? Some of you may be really consistent, but you're like at eight seconds consistent, not 10 seconds. And then other people might be averaging 10, but they're at 12, down to eight or seven, so their spread is a lot very wide as well. So you can make some very simple pictures to kind of show the, the variation and see where do I fit as a way to kind of assess how what's going on. And those are some simple charts you can do. And we don't have to do all the statistics, we can just plot the data and let the data tell us the story of what's going on. Alex. How do you account for variability in the timers themselves? Yeah. That is a variable, right? So, sh so your partner might have been dead on and you were the problem. You were slow on responding to their timing. That is all part of the measurements. And so it gets a little confusing, right? There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And how the person doing the measurements and collecting the data and doing the interpretation, is, that's all part of a measurement system. So it's not just the equipment, the stopwatch. You know, we assume the stopwatch is pretty accurate. But we don't know, that could be a variable. This could be an Apple product. You might have an update going on Come in your on. system. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We don't know. It's a question, right? We have to, how do we go prove that? To rule that out of the problem. And that's part of the investigation we go through is what are the, the sources of the variation? Is it the timer? Is it the device? Is it the response? We need to come up with a better system of either counting, you had one banana, two banana. Um, maybe we could share some of those ideas. Maybe it's that, you know, when I say start, then I'm gonna give you an indication I'm ready to say stop or something, you know, something like that. You work out a system that gets you more reliable, closer to the real number. And I didn't give any feed, you weren't really supposed to get feedback on the data, but then now you would do it a little differently with some feedback that says, well, I was really low or really high, I need to go a little longer. I need to recalibrate myself. So these are the types of things you could do to understand your process a little bit better. You say, are we getting the same results like we expect? And that, so this is an example of that. Was there any, any questions about, about that? So we're just saying, let's look at the process, let's repeat it, and then compare it to somebody else and see if we can get the matching results. Here's another thing we could use uh, a study for. And this isn't a measurement, it's a assessment, or it's a criteria, or a categorization of results. So if I gave you a blind taste test, and I didn't tell you which water it was, could you tell the difference between these four types of water? You don't think so? No. <laughs> so anyway, you could. Yeah. So my, I lived in Arizona for a few years between times living in Portland, and my husband and I did do this experiment, and I nailed five out of six brands, nice. and we did like 30 iterations, and 
it has distinct tastes. Okay. And, uh, You're pretty good then. I didn't think I would be. <laughs> So, so this is an example of something called the attribute study, where you're not making measurements, but you're categorizing or you're trying to put it into a bucket. I think this alone application should be rejected. I think this one should be accepted. And then we're going to give you that loan a week later and say, well, how would you rank this? And the first time you accepted it, now you say, I'm feeling generous today. Let's, um, or the first time you rejected it, the second time you say, I'm feeling generous, I'm going to accept it this time. So that's a way to check repeatability. Is how do they assess the same thing later on? So you can do that with categorizations and stuff like that, or pass fail results. I reject that, I accept that, or I'm gonna call this a low risk client, or a high risk client, or a medium risk. Do I always put them in the right bucket every time they come through? That's a way to check that as well. Because that's we're making a lot of decisions based on that information, how we group things and categorize things. So if that's wrong, then all of our data is, is misleading. So I did this study with one of my classes, and those are the actual results. I gave them 12 cups to drink out of, and tester one, here is their answers. To these, these are the right answers. This is their answers. Here's tester two, here's tester three. And then I figured out what percentage of them got, all, where they all agreed on the same answer. So this one, only one out of three got it right. Two out of three. This one, they all got right that one time. But then I went over here and I said, I gave them generic two other times, and they couldn't get it right. So they might have guessed and got lucky. But the end result was only 8% of the time did they all get, you know, did they all get it right. You think that's a really good assessment? Should we be using these testers to correctly identify which water this came from? Probably not a very good system. So if this is it, I'd say we either need to fix the system or we need to scrap this as a system. And we need to come up with a better technique. Or you can go in and train everybody on how to do it. <laughs> so there's a way to do that with categorization. So anytime you're grouping things, categorizing things, that's a way to do is uh, figure out a way to check for that. And that means you send things through a second or third time. It's going to take a little bit extra time to do that, but you're going to learn a lot from that process. Because from here, we're going to use that information to make improvements. And we have to make sure that we trust the data that we're looking at. And I find this a lot that the data it doesn't always <coughs> come out very good when we do these types of studies. And so we need to go back and train and redo it and come up with better clarification, better criteria, and get everyone on the same page with that. Then we can go forward and say, now that we know that, where are our big problem areas and where should we be focusing our attention? So no, they could not detect the water. So another technique that I mentioned was Walter Schuhart identified some things called um, monitoring the data and looking for trends and patterns in the data. So uh, just a, a simple example here. Let's say that you are a pitching coach for a baseball team or a softball team, and you are measuring the fastball speed of your pitcher. And you want to know, when should I take out my pitcher because I know that they're losing speed and I feel like they're going to be more hittable when they start losing speed. So I'm going to plot the data over time. I'm going to record all their speeds of every pitch during the game and keep track of which inning we're in. And then at what point on that chart do you think that we should take the pitcher out because they're starting to lose speed? Their speed's decreasing. About what inning do you think <coughs> that shows up? Somewhere around here? Yeah, fifth and sixth. Fifth and sixth? Yeah. Definitely by the eighth inning, right? You can see things really start to fall off there. So we can kind of eyeball this and say, eh, I see some stuff going on. In statistical process control, we use statistics to try to pick up the pattern. And there are certain rules we're looking for. And one of those rules is, if you look at the average over that time period, and you get nine points below the average in a row, that's picking up a trend or a shift in the data. And so, for this one, the middle of the sixth inning, this pitch was the start of a, a run of nine points that were less than the historic average for that pitcher. So that was really when the problem started in. 
Now we waited down here and maybe saw the effects of it here. But the statistics would say it's actually started earlier than that. And so if we were trying to take out a picture, we might have looked at, if we are tracking this using these types of techniques, it allows us to identify a trend or a shift in the process well before it actually shows up as a real problem. So it's giving us an early warning sign that something's not right in the process. So that's one of the more powerful things we can do with some of the data. And it's good just to plot the data over time. That's gonna tell you a lot of information, but when you really get to really detailed knowledge about your process, then you wanna start employing some a little bit more statistical techniques in there. So you can do that with your processes. If you start getting a bunch of orders and it's starting to pick up a trend, how do we react so we don't get behind on our orders? How do we get ahead of the game and not be surprised and caught off guard? And we don't wait till we get down here when we start saying, oh my gosh, we're overloaded, things are going haywire. We might have been able to identify that days or weeks in advance with some of these techniques. There's an example of a wastewater treatment department in the city of Tyler in, in Texas. They said that they were able to save $80,000 by looking at their historical data and monitoring the process. And they were adding some kind of um, material or chemical into the process trying to make sure that they met the limits. But what they realized is they're putting way more in there than they needed to. And so by looking at this data, they said, well, we can get, kind of like your example with the golfing, how do we get as close to the limits as we can without going over? And so by doing some of the analysis on that, they are able to save $80,000 in chemicals and still meet the regulations that they had for that uh, wastewater treatment of the material, so, or of the water. So, um, so that saved time and labor of putting that material in there and the actual dollars of what they were spending on the chemicals. And then the third tool that we talk about is something called capability. How capable is the current process able to meet the requirements that we have? Kind of like the golf example. How capable am I of staying between 150 yards and 250 yards? So this is another wastewater uh, discharge process. We're trying to measure the pH level, and you can't go below a certain pH level because then that affects the, the water quality. And so we can take, collect data about the process, and you can see that we're getting very close, and at times we've even gone below that. So we're trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we shift our process a little bit higher so we're not so close? That's one way. We can try to move our average over this direction so we can stay away from this area but maybe that would cost money to do. What if we were able to figure out a way to reduce the variation? So we could keep the same average, but we don't have as much spread. That would also keep us further away from this lower limit. And what we can also do with this data is we can do calculations down here. It says 4% of the time, you are gonna be beyond the limits. Even if you just take some samples and you don't measure any that are out of the tolerance, the data and the statistics say you will be out and you do have times when you're out. And if somebody comes by and happens to do a check, you've got a 4% risk of being in violation. So it allows you to look at not only just the data you collected, but look at the statistics and extrapolate that out to say, am I what kind of risk am I really dealing with in this process? And so that's another way that we've used something like capability to try to quantify how risky we are right now. And then we would say, that's probably too much risk. How do we get that to 1% or less than 1%? Or maybe even zero. So we get maybe a Six Sigma process because it's so important. And it depends on, well, how much do we get fined? If it's $100,000, I might really want to be spending some time getting to Six Sigma performance. So, but we have to look at the data and we have to compare it to the, the requirements. And you can visually see that just in the picture that, hey, we're, we're probably too close to those limits. And remember we talked about the, the limits in the very beginning with the oranges, that those limits are kind of a gray area. It's not black and white. So just because you got four, um, the limit here was 5.5 .5 pH level, just because you got 5.51 pH, don't feel like that's a, a great thing. We talked about measurement error too. What if that's actually 5.4 .4 and you measured it and it happened to give you a result a little bit higher? So that's why we don't, we want to stay away from these limits as much as possible. We don't want our data to be near those limits. Does that make sense? Those are kind of the three concepts that we're
talking about when we look at data is, do I trust the measurements? What happens in the data over time? Is it trending or shifting on us? And how close are we to the limits, if we have that? Not everybody's gonna have processes with limits on it, but if you do, then this is a really good tool to use. Can you say those three again? Yep, it's the, the gauge r and &R study about measurements. How do I trust the measurements? Second one is how do I pick up trends and shifts and patterns in the data? And the third one is how well do I meet the requirements or limits that we have to meet? And am I at risk of going outside those limits? So how do I make these charts? How many of you use Excel or Google Sheets or one of those spreadsheet formulas? Okay, it's a pretty common package. And it does some of this basic stuff. I can calculate average, I can calculate variation, standard deviations, some basic statistics that I can do in Excel. I can make some graphs in Excel. So it's very powerful and it can handle lots of data and do a lot of summary, simple analysis. And so it's easy to use, a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, I can send an Excel file to somebody and they can probably open it. Um, I can use it for lots of different purposes. Even though I'm not doing any kind of calculation, I can still use Excel for nice tables and nice forms and things like that. And it's usually free or it's provided by your company or it's very inexpensive to get. And so a lot of people use Excel, but it doesn't really handle some of the stuff we're talking about here. And that's where there's other packages out there that are available. And I use something called Minitab, which has been around for quite a while, but it does a lot of those charts I've shown already, which are much nicer looking and more uh, analysis that goes along with it. And it's just one click and it's presents, you know, creates the chart. And there's other software packages. These two actually are bolt-ons to Excel that do a lot of these types of analyses. And those are very much more uh, inexpensive, <coughs> more affordable. And then there's other standalone stat packages. R is a free one, a little more complex to use, but it is free. This one's another version of like a MIDI tab type program. So there is some software that goes along with Six Sigma usually, and that's usually part of the training classes that people go through is how to, how to, how to use the software to do some of these analyses. And they get graphs that look like that. That's much nicer looking and more um, specialized and cleaner than probably what you can make in Excel. And you can do some of this with Excel, but it's gonna take a long time to kind of craft that, unless you have like some kind of bolt-on program like that. So that's one of the advantages is once you kind of learn some of these techniques, then if you have a good software package, that can really help speed along the process. I probably spend 1% of my time in the software doing it and running analysis, and the rest of my time trying to figure out how to get the data in a format that I can then plug in and do the analysis. So this is like, not the easy part, but this is not the time consuming part. It's understanding the process and talking to people. What data do we need? What problems are we having? How do I get my hands on that data? Oh, here's a stack of papers. How do we get that into a spreadsheet? That's where all the, the hard work comes in. It's not making these charts. This is not the difficult part. Now, I gotta have some knowledge about how to interpret it, and there's lots of things like that, and that's usually what the training classes are geared around. But you can learn a lot with the right type of charts that we can see visually, and we did that with the exercise. If you just plotted out the data, you can see that this one has more spread than this other one, and this one is lower in around the 10 second line, and this person's above the 10 second line. You can see a lot of stuff with graphs. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of make some graphs, and then we'll worry about the statistics later. And that's less scary for a lot of people. So let's look at the data graphically first. You can see lots of interesting patterns there. For example, one of the things you can actually get into in the statistics is say, here is a, a food waste collection process. A university did a study and they were collecting up how, many, how much food is thrown away by students. They made some improvements to the process and then they collected more data. And these bars represent variability, kind of like the, the plots you might have made for your time data. And you can see that the red line would be about the average, and you can see it dropped. But one of the questions in Six Sigma we ask is, is that a real improvement, or did you just happen to, get luck, happen to get lucky that week? You know, maybe it was a holiday week and there was less students there. How do we do some of that analysis? And is that fluctuation, you can see there's overlap on this, is that enough to say there's a real improvement or is it just a random luck that we happen to get a low reading? 
So you can get into some of the details. When it gets really gray and it's not as obvious what happens, that's where the statistics come into play. And they can say, yep, that's a statistical improvement. Or it's too early to tell. We need to collect, continue to collect some data before we can make a, a bold statement like that. And so that's what a lot of um, things we can get into there. And that's called, um, we can do that through something called an analysis of variance, which is a breaking out the variability. Where does all the variation come from? Well, some of it comes from here, some of it comes from here, some of it comes from here, and that's part of the analysis we can break it out. And what we're trying to figure out is where is it coming from the most? Is it the person? Is it the process? Is it the customer? We can do some of those types of things. So I wanna walk you through a project I worked on and talk about another tool called regression analysis company I work for is spending $4 million a year in electricity. That's a lot of money. So I, after I picked myself off the ground when I saw that number, I <laughs> said, I think there's some opportunity I can apply some statistics to this. Give me a shot. So first I said, well, can I get a hold of the data? And they said, yep, here's a paper printout like you get at home for your utility bill. I was like, no, like the detailed data. And they said, no, we don't really have a lot of that data. And first problem was, you know, if we don't have a lot of data, how are we going to be able to make some improvements on this? Uh, they did actually have some utility data every five second increments, but it was for a very, very large building. And so we could see the patterns and usage, but I didn't know where in this large building it was coming from. And so that became the big challenge is how do I get my hands on detailed data so I can go figure out where it's coming from in the first place? So we had to go... So we looked at the overall data, and it told us a little bit of information. I'll share with that, that information. But then, to get the detailed data, we had to go do the hard work and walk around the whole building over the holidays at weird times of day and collect this data manually off of like a readout off of a substation in the building. So, all right, that's what we have to do. We gotta get this data to be able to figure out what, where to focus. Because it was a million square foot facility. There's no way we can just kinda like, guess at where we should start. And we did that, it took a long time. So this is the high level data. The blue and the red represent different meters. It's all the same building though. And the meters mean nothing in the building. Red doesn't say this is all maintenance equipment, this is manufacturing, this is office. It has no rhyme or reason to it. All, it's like a spaghetti of a web of stuff on what they power up. So we couldn't use red or blue to give us any information. But we did notice that it never drops below a certain level. No matter what time of day or weekend, it is always at least this amount. And when we, and people come into work, it goes up a little bit, but it still never drops below this base load. So that pointed us to, this is something that where energy is being used all the time. So that helped us narrow a little bit down to, it's not production, at least not a huge amount of it, because we can see that impact. We can see when people show up to work, those are the weekdays, but what is going on the weekends and at night that's still using that much energy? So we were able to piece together with this walking around data collection a pie chart, and it's not complete at all. There's 40% of the data we had no idea where it's coming from still. But we were able to figure out, there's some big chunks of data. Let's start there, we have something started. And that was by going and looking at certain uh, stations that were hooked up to certain equipment. So we said, well, HVAC, that's definitely important. And manufacturing is important. We did some discussions and we talked to some people and they kind of reiterated, yeah, there's some opportunities in HVAC. The way we heat and cool that building, I think there's some opportunities there. So it kind of gave us an inkling that we were on the right track. Another thing we tried to do is something called regression. And it says, well, can we use other data to try to figure out where the source of all the variability is coming from in the process? So here's the, the, the data by month over that time period for kilowatt hour usage. And it goes up and it comes back down. And then it goes back up and then it comes back down. This is about two years worth of data, maybe three. Two and a half months, two and a half years. So what would be your first idea around this data? Why does it go up and down like this? Yeah, how'd you come up with that? What are you noticing about that? Summer. 
the summer months, right? Those are the higher ones, right? Okay, so yeah, that seems pretty obvious. Well, how much is coming from temperature? We can do an analysis and figure that out. And so I took the outside temperature every month and I plugged it into this model and it told me, the temperature tell, tells me about 60% of the fluctuation. And now you can see I've, I've created, this red line is a model of the data. And so it's not perfect, but it got me a lot better than just an average, a straight line. So it's starting to fit when I plugged in temperature. It started to fit that pattern a little bit, but it's still not perfect. I want to get it better. So what are some other things I should look at for data collection to see if it affects my electricity usage that month? See if there's a, like a thermostat being used versus humans changing the temperature. Okay, so let's see, I could do something with, uh, maybe just generically, let's look at how many employees are working that month. Mm -hmm. Maybe some measure of work hours. You know, was there a lot of overtime? Was there an extra whole set of people coming in that month? So we tried to do something with employee counts. Maybe there's a big layoff or a big boom in, in hiring. Maybe that caused some of it. So we got with HR, we gathered up the data for employee count. Yeah. Well, and also, is there shipping times during that time? Are they leaving doors open, not doors open? You know, yeah. In the processing area. Right. So we're trying to figure out how can I roll that up to a monthly number? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there was a lot of discussion around some of those things. And in that one, we didn't have a very good way to estimate that. That did come up in discussions is around behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't think we'd be able to see that in the numbers month to month. Okay. Like we didn't have a measure of, you know, we weren't tracking how many hours the door was open, the shipping doors open. <coughs> yeah. But that would be nice. That would have been great to know that. Yeah. How about the electricity over the production, the output? Output. Okay. Yeah. How many units did we make? And maybe that would give us a, an estimate for the manufacturing impact. Because that was one of the things on our pie chart. So, yep, that was one thing we looked at. Production output that month. How about the, uh, the efficiency of the HVAC equipment itself? Yeah, um, there was a power factor on the bill that kind of gets at efficiency. Um, but we didn't really have a way of measuring or we couldn't tell how long, how much the equipment is running. They weren't tracking that, so that was something we talked about. Can we start tracking that? How much is it on? Yeah, or maybe, maybe that's a more accurate picture than just the temperature. Maybe the age of the equipment? Yeah, that was some of the stuff we st would start digging into if we saw that it was the HVAC. That's definitely from this discussion. It says, you know, we can't control humidity. We can't control temperature, but we can control what gets affected by temperature, which is the heating and cooling, right? And how old is the equipment? Is it efficient? Oh, yeah. Yep. So... Uh, can we think about the electricity per the square foot of different area in, in the factory? For example, the office area should consume this much kilowatt per mm -hmm. hour. This production area should consume this much. This is this much area. This is this much area. Yep. So yeah. So we didn't. We weren't able to break out that data. We had a little bit of data from walking around to figure <coughs> out this goes to office, but the square footage was the same each month. So. We didn't have a way of knowing that this area got used more energy or not. So um, that would have been nice, and that's what we were trying to hope for is more detailed data. Yeah. What about like filters in the building? Like maybe the filters were dirty. Right. And yeah. Changed. Yep, that's absolutely that could be. And so what we were trying to figure out, could we measure that month to month somehow? Like this month you have five dirty filters versus 10 next month, and that might explain it, but we didn't have that type of detail. We, we, so we did start gathering some stuff about the output data, the employee count. Actually, we don't work the same number of days each month, and the billing cycle doesn't, isn't always 30 days. Sometimes it's 30 days, 32 days, 28 days. Sometimes there's the holidays, so there's days they didn't work only 18 days in a month, sometimes it's 22 or 23 days in a month. So we plug those things in, very high level metrics. And we found out that employees do have an impact. The number of spares that they made each month, not the actual final product, but the like the spare parts, that was an indicator. And the temperature. And when we did that, we got to a lot better model, like 75% 
other variation than understood. 100% would be like a perfect model. You could predict it down to the penny. But 75% is pretty good. And it spits out a little equation that says, if you want to know what the kilowatt usage will be, you tell me how, what the temperature this month was and how many spares you made and how many employees work in the building. And within about 75% accuracy, I can get you a pretty good guess of what the kilowatt hours will be that month. And so now we're able to use this to try to figure out how do we, now we can predict what's going on. Because if the energy goes up month to month, is it because something's going wrong in the equipment? Or because we happen to need that energy for output or, or business reasons? And they didn't know. So now we have an equation. Now we can start predicting what's going to happen going forward. And we can say, let's focus on these three things. This is an indicator of HVAC equipment. This is an indicator of manufacturing. And this is an indicator of the need we need to get rid of all our employees, right? <laughs> no, what, what would that mean? If employees are, are driving the amount of usage, what should we focus on? Not getting rid of them. Not training. Right, Ar around what? Around processes, procedures, and how much electricity. Yes, and behaviors and turning stuff off and shutting off monitors and powering down critical equipment during breaks and all that stuff. That's what it tells me. Um, although getting rid of employees would reduce your number, but that's not the goal. <laughs> that's a bad way to look at it. So with that data, then we could, that helped reaffirm that we were going down the right path with the HVAC equipment. So we did dig into it and we found out they heat the building 24 seven at the same temperature all year round because it's just easier that way. So we said, but that's costing a lot of money to do that. Maybe we can come up with a pilot project to show what would we do if we did a smart shutdown based on employee occupancies instead. And so we were able to do some studies, um, validated how much savings we would get. So we picked one small section of the building and tried it out, did some surveys. When, how long do you work? What time do you leave to go home? What time do you come in? What do you do in this area? <coughs> What if we shut down the temperature and raised it in the, in the summer five degrees at night? Would that be okay? And if we, in the, in the winter, what if we lowered the temperature a little bit during these times? Would you have any concerns about that? Of course there's concerns, but here's the potential savings we could get if we did that. And we came up with this override button that says, if you ever come in and you don't like it, just press this button and you'll get two hours of normal temperature and you keep pressing the button as long as you're here, but you have the ability to override it if you want. And so after that was put into play, then we had $300,000 in savings in energy. And I think a lot of it was we were able to back up, not only, we had three things that pointed us. We had our own observations, we had observations from our maintenance team, and we had the statistical data. And all three were pointing to the HVAC equipment <coughs> or opportunity, and we had data that said, here's the actual badge swipes of employees when they come in and out of the area. They don't work as much on the weekends as they say they do. They don't leave at 10 o'clock like they say they do. You know, th that's the real data we actually gathered to kind of help prove that out. So that's an example of how we can utilize some of this data. Uh, how many of you have heard of something called split testing? Like A-B testing? A-B, yeah, A-B split testing. Basically, you have two options. They use this a lot now with social media or advertising online. I got a red ad and a blue ad, and I'm gonna test them both out and see, do people click on the red ad or the blue ad more often? And if they click on the blue, then I'm gonna start using more blue ads, right? So very simple experiment. Well, in something called design of experiments, there's something, we use this for, when it's a little bit more complicated than just two things. What if I want to know whether, what the, whether the image makes a difference? Maybe I'll put a nature picture in one, and then another one I'll put a business building or an off, a people meeting in a meeting room. If they click on those, does that make a difference? What about the message? If I make a very shocking message on one and the other one very inspirational, does that have an influence? Or what if I put the price on there and another one I leave the price off? Does that make a difference? So once you get beyond simple A versus B testing, 
this design of experiments can allow you to try lots of different things and lots of different scenarios. And then I don't have to keep track of all this. The data works out and tells me what happened afterwards. So I'll run one ad will be a blue with a nature and a shocking message and the price not included. And maybe the next time it'll be the price is included, but it's also shocking, also nature, but red instead. And you do all the different combinations and then we run the analysis and it tells us nature, the picture doesn't matter, the, the price does matter, but what really matters is the message. And the color matters, but not as much. So not only tells us what's important, it tells us how important they are to each other. So that's the power of designed experiments is you can change lots of things. And if you do it in the right way, you can uncover what actually happened. You don't have to keep track of it in your head every time you change it. So. Very, very powerful technique. Um, and we usually use this when we get into more complex situations. We're really trying to figure out what's happening in our process. So we, we force changes into it and see what happens. So um, let's come back. If, I think we have time for this exercise, but I want to come back to that on the DOE because I want to make sure we cover the rest of this. Okay. The belt system. That's always an interesting topic. What does a master black belt mean? Well, it means I took a lot of training and I've been doing this a long time. Um, there's different levels starting from white belt, which is basically this type of class. You're getting an overview of some of the concepts and terms, getting familiar with a little bit of history, some of the terminology. Um, and so it's a, it's a good introductory class. And that'd be something like in a company, everybody would go through this type of a class. So how many of you are familiar with the martial arts belt system or have taken some classes? So it's it, basically they took it directly from that. They said, how do we make the belt levels match up with the Six Sigma knowledge and, and experience? So as you mature through here, you go to yellow belt, then you move up to green belt and then black belt. And these are different levels of training you would go through on some of these terms and stuff. You know, a lot of you taken some statistics classes in school. That's, you know, 16 hours worth of training, or what is the whole course usually? If it's a one week class, it could be up to 40 hours of training. So that's about a week's worth of training on statistics. So that'd be something like a green belt level material. So you go through training, and then you also have to show project experience, because that's really where you're gonna learn these stuff. You can sit in a classroom and I can teach statistics all day long, but until you take your data and plug it in and look at the charts, look at what it tells you, that's where you're really gonna learn and become more proficient. So it requires project experience, and there's pros and cons of having certification. On the lean side, there really isn't a lot of certification. They just say, do what you can, and your project experience and, and improvement work is what gives you the experience and knowledge. Six Sigma is a little more structured around certification levels. I can, I can argue both ways. I'm not for or against them. I, I think they're nice sometimes, but they also drive people to get the certification, not really learn how to do the tools and, and actually solve problems with it. So, yeah. I was really curious about the certification. Uh, like you talked about, it started with GE and then you know, companies like Wells Fargo, American Express adopted it and now places like UCSD are offering certifications. Yeah. And I'm really curious because um, I got certified way back in the day yeah. and how does that even compare? How, are, how does that work and why are universities offering it to students? Yeah, well because employers are offering it as part or asking for it as part of their resume. They say, do you have any Lean or Six Sigma experience or certification? And so I think students are saying, hey, I want to boost my chances of getting a job. I'd like to learn about this. This is what industry, some industries have, have realized that they want that skill set. So I think that's driving a lot of it. Um, they also have some time to work on it more than people when they get into industry have time to do it sometimes. Um, so I would say the, um, depends on the purpose for the certification. So if you're just wanted to get through the first screening of a, a resume, your resume through a job that you're applying for, certification works. But when I would try to hire in somebody in my department, um, I would deep, deep dive into how do they got the certification, what was the program they went through, how much project experience do they have. If they said I took some classes and I took a test, 
that's not gonna weigh as well as someone who isn't certified, but I can show you 10 projects I worked on. So it depends on the purpose of what you're trying to do with it. And so ultimately, it's really come down to the project experience. I think it's the most important part. I've had, met people who aren't certified who should be, and I met people who are certified that shouldn't. So just like every kind of certification, you have a whole spectrum of people. Does that make sense, or? It, it does, yeah. So how it applies today, it, there's, there's no standard around that. There's some rough standards, but a green belt doesn't mean the same thing as other green belts. And so you have to ask a lot of questions about what the, what exactly that background means. And then I saw that ASQ is trying to standardize what does it mean. Yep. But they're not doing any backward integration for people who already have them from what I could see. I didn't look too closely, don't hold it against Yeah, me. so they do a test and they, for certain levels, they require project, turn you, you turn in a project of work mm -hmm. you did to prove out that you have some project experience. Mm -hmm. But like Greenbelt level, they don't require you to prove that you've worked on the project. They just say you have to know this knowledge. You don't even have to take any uh, any training either. You could self-study for that. Other places will say you need to take training and you need to do a project and you have to pass an exam. So the question is, it varies a lot. And, but it's really more about what is the employer actually looking for if you're looking for, from a job perspective. So again, try to focus on, here's what I've actually applied with this knowledge. That's the most important thing. That's where you're really gonna learn. Same thing on the lean side. All the training in the world is nice, but what have you done with it? That's really valuable. Any more questions on the belt systems? So you might say <laughs> green belt training, black belt training, yellow belt training, that's what they refer to. Another project I worked on, if we go back to capability, is this is a supplier. They had, this was their specification. They, had, they were not supposed to have any product outside of this specification. Here's the amount of product that was outside of the specification. <laughs> in the red. Uh, needless to say, they had a hard time delivering product to us. In fact, 95% of the time, it didn't meet the specifications. So, Couple things are going on here. Either A, they have a process that varies too much, which we can see that. B, that their process is centered in the wrong plot spot. Maybe their time is too high or too low, or their performance is offset some amount, which is a little bit of that. What would be a third thing we should think about as well? So we talked about the, main, the average is off or the variability is too wide. What's a third part of this that Maybe we don't always talk about it, but. The standards are too high? The standards are too high. Maybe the specification is wrong. Maybe it's unrealistic for this type of product or this service that we're asking for. Well, guess what? It was all of them. The standard was too hot, too difficult, and too challenging for what they actually, what we actually needed. We put unrealistic requirements on them. And they had a lot of opportunity to, to make it better. And so that's what ended up happening. They improved their process. They got some variation reduced. And we did some analysis on our end and found out, actually, we can take a lot of these. We can take a lot of these. And they work fine. We were being way too strenuous. And when we did that, we figured out that they could go from 5% success to 85% success. And what, that was all getting thrown away, thrown in the trash. Now we could use that, and guess what? They're not, they're gonna have to make up that money somewhere, so they're charging us for all the stuff they're throwing away. So when we worked out the right limits, then they said, well, I can get you a, a price break because we're not having to pay for all the stuff we throw away now. And all of a sudden, we were able to keep up with the deliveries. They were able to keep up with our delivery needs. So it was a win-win all the way around. We saved money, they saved money. We got the product we wanted, it worked. Customer was happy. But we had to go through that type of analysis to figure that out. Because the engineer said, nope, we can't open it up. <clears throat> and the supplier said, nope, we can't do any better than what we're doing. And both of them were, we challenged and were able to change. Yes, you can do better. And yes, we can open this up. And then one more example, healthcare. I worked on a project. Um, 
We were doing testing of patients on Coumadin or Warfarin. We were, they were getting measurements called an INR, which tells them how, basically how thick or thin their blood is. And they have to be in a certain range so that they have lower risk of stroke or heart attacks or other complications. So the first question we, that I ask is, what? And what would be your first question when you get handed some data from them on the patient test results? How good is the data? How good is the data? Can we trust the data? So I don't know the question. Well, the question was, of course we can. It's coming from a, a professional lab, a certified lab. <coughs> Not a good answer. Uh, let's do an experiment and test it out. So we took patients with their, we got approval for all this. We took the patient's blood and we broke it up into six vials and we sent three to this lab and three to another lab. And we had them say, send us back the results. <coughs> and these are the results. For patient one, the average of the three labs was this and the average from the other lab was this. And so this lab results versus this lab results. And you can see that it slightly goes up from one lab to another. And it actually ended up being like 40% of the tolerance, which is not good. It means there's, there's a lot of variability coming from the labs themselves. So they weren't matching each other. They could repeat themselves, but they couldn't repeat each other. So if the patient went to one lab and next week went to the other lab, their results just by changing labs would change. And what happens is the nurses make a dose change to their medication as a result of that. And the patients are older, and now we've added another variable in the mix is now instead of using this old medication, we need you to change the dosage amount. So instead of two and a half milligrams, three milligrams, two and a half, three, now I need you to go three and a half, three, two, two and a half, three during the week. How much error do you think will happen with patients taking the right medication at the right days? Probably a lot. So we wanted to reduce down the number of changes we had to make. Is it really the patient's data or is it the way we're taking the data? So we got down to it and found out, we found out where the cause of it was coming from. One of the labs was using a different technique to standardize their lab. And so we identified the process of how they standardized their equipment was different for each lab. How many samples they took, you can see B took a lot of data and A took very, very little data. A also took staff, and they took real patients. So we found some inconsistency with that. And so they came up with a way to standardize those. So everybody got the same number, and then when that corrected it, it cleaned up all the differences between the labs. So now when we see differences in the patient, it's more likely that it's their actual um, behaviors of what they ate and what they did for workouts and how well they slept and what time of day they took the, the, their tests. That's more of what we would see from the variation, not because of which lab they went to. We also trended their data over time with the SPC chart. The green is the, the range they're supposed to be within. This is a very typical patient. This is not an unusual one or one that was struggling. This is one of the typical ones. And when we look at these charts, what it also identifies is, first of all, they can't meet that green. That is unrealistic. So I pushed back and said, the specs are too difficult for the patient. I couldn't get much momentum going down that path. But I said, well, let's look at the yellow, and the yellow is the typical variation. So even though this is out of spec, this is not unusual. So let's not change their medication around, just leave it. It's gonna balance out. But here, yeah, maybe we now we're in this red zone. This is way outside of a normal reading. Now let's start asking some more questions about the patient. What did you do this weekend? Did you take all your medicine? Did you take too much, too little? Have you changed your diet in some way? Are you eating more salads or less salads? Vitamin K has a lot to do with their, their results. And we start digging into behavioral stuff. And maybe their medication is fine, their behaviors are off that week. And so let's not change the medication, let's correct the behavior change that needs to happen. But here, let's not change it up because it's not unusual from a statistics standpoint. It's not unusual, even though it doesn't meet the requirements. So trying to embed some of this, these techniques into that was, again, trying to get at, are we really, do we need to make a change to the medication or not? 
And so that was a really interesting project and pretty eye-opening getting into it. But even something that seems like so scientific has got opportunities for improvement there. So the question around Lean and Six Sigma. First of all, is there any questions about just Six Sigma in general? Those are some of the tools and techniques that are involved. Well, we talked about this need for data. We talked about a DMAIC model to walk through. We talked about some different statistical tools and charts and graphs that we can use to help us understand what's happening in the process. Does that make sense? So with Lean, um, it's a lot easier. We're talking about identifying waste and we're looking at processes and how can you make your job uh, less frustrating and simpler and more organized. That's something everybody can do. When I start putting some of the charts over up on the board, start talking about statistics and analysis, not everybody gets as excited as I do. <laughs> some, I don't know why, but. <laughs> so it scares people off a little bit. And so some people gravitate more towards lean. So I would say, go with that. If you don't, if you haven't taught lean techniques, start there because everybody usually feels like they can contribute and participate in that. And there's gonna be some people who say, you know what, I really like the numbers, I like the data. Those are the people we start talking about Six Sigma stuff. And start teaching some of the techniques and looking at the software and things like that. Um, use the DMAIC structure. I use that for all projects, whether it's a Lean or Six Sigma project, because I like the structure. Got a client right now who's trying to get a, cycle, a lead time from six weeks down to four weeks. And so, show me the real data. Where are we at today? You said a four to six weeks, I need to know a little bit more than that. Does it go eight weeks sometimes in two weeks? Or is it pretty consistent at five weeks? That makes a big difference. And then when I make improvements, it's gonna be a series of maybe lean events, but at the end I wanna make sure that I actually see tangible results. And I use the Six Sigma tools for complex or difficult problems where I've got a lot of data and variability in the process. After I've tried some simple stuff and that doesn't seem to fix it. Um, risk mitigation activities. So there are some other tools I didn't talk about with failure modes and, and effects and more predictive things. Or I'm trying to prevent problems or to reduce the risk down. There's some Six Sigma tools for that. Or I need that high quality performance that's gotta be up in the four, five, six Sigma level performance. So we see that with like people who work at uh, suppliers to Intel and automotive suppliers where they have to have that high quality. They really gravitate towards Six Sigma as a way to get that quality up to the high, highest level possible. So here's some other ideas about these tools where they might be applicable you might think about. For the gauge r, &R do you guys have ideas around where you could apply gauge r, &R in your business? Checking the data and your consistency. Sometimes it's I don't match what my customer says. We, we're getting different results. They say it takes this long, I said it only took this long. There's a, we can't reproduce our, each other's results. Maybe we have people recording something in a database and it's not always done the same way. They mark that as late, someone else marks it as not on time. Or someone says it's overdue and this person says it uh, didn't meet schedule. You know, it just could be a naming thing, or it could be actually how they treat those categories. So, gauge R and R, does that make sense? Can I trust the measurements? How do I and how do I prove that out? SBC, you can do that for trending your expenses. So I've been trying to track this for when I go on travel and teach. What is my food spending per per day? Is that trending up or down? Um, what are hotel costs? What are the training room costs? What are the sales? What does our website traffic look like? Is it trending up or down? What's our call volume or email volume? How is that trending? How about defect rates or on-time delivery performance? What is our suppliers, how are they performing? What's their data look like? How fast is our website working? Is that trending or going slower? How do we identify that quicker? What's my employee turnover or absenteeism? Is that going up or down? Capability stuff, how well can I forecast? Can I forecast plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%? I had a group that was trying to hit 5%. 
as a goal on their forecast. I took, looked at their data and they were plus or minus 40%. So I said, first of all, your goal was totally unrealistic for now. So don't beat yourself up. You know, and nobody was doing it right that said, well, we do better than the other location. And I looked at the data and said, you guys, none of you do it very well. <laughs> so first, let's set a realistic goal, like 30%. Then you can work on something like 5% later. Customer response time. Are we gonna meet our goal at the end of the month at the pace we're going? Do we have an event coming up? What's the likelihood we're actually gonna sell out the event? Are we going at the right pace for that? Do we have enough staff to meet the customer demands? Those are some stuff you could do with some of the data. Regression could be around quote predictions. Could be around hiring success factors. What makes a good employee? What does that history look like? What kind of categories do they fit into? Do we see differences between employees? Where's our electricity usage going to? How do we look at two processes and compare them to each other? Do we have seasonal modeling that we need to take into account for the type of business we have? Can we estimate the attendance of people or food? So I have to do estimations on this, right? I have to print out documents and papers. How many people are gonna show up? So I'm trying to figure out how do I collect that data so I can get better estimates. It's not 100% every time, surprisingly, right? And experiments, can I do some stuff with online ads or email click-throughs or worker performance? Do I see differences? Maybe they need different tools and when they give them different tools, they do better or worse. Or I'm trying to optimize a process or I'm trying to address a complex process. Does that make sense? Or you're, hopefully you're thinking of some ideas. So there is um, ASQ, you mentioned, provides some certification programs if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, I also teach for a class called, or a company called Six Sigma.us, and they teach classes nationwide. We teach Lean and Six Sigma training. So again, that's the training part. What people struggle is they go back to their work and they don't have time or they don't have a project lined up. And then the knowledge is, is lost soon afterwards if you don't get to apply it right away. So I'm always harping, harping on people Get a project, start one, get it going so you can apply what you're learning. We have local classes for that too. And then we have also free workshops, so there's a handout here. If you wanna take one for other workshops coming up, behavior change, culture of collaboration, and then lean primer, if you haven't taken that yet. And then questions, answers, yes? Yeah, I just wanna say, I really appreciate your plug for the real work value with the certifications because that's what I've been hearing in yeah. the corporate world, okay. in the real world, is it's like, you know, you can go get that, but if you, you don't know, know how to apply it to at projects. Villanova University, yes. if you really want one, but right. is it worth the money yeah. that it's printed on? Probably not. And so it's like people, they're like, wait until you're on a project, mm -hmm. you know. But it sounds like you can do that with the Lean Portland kind of volunteer yes. too. So that's a way to get yep. in. That would, that would count for project experience, right. absolutely. So if, you're, if you can't find a project to work, come talk to us. We've got groups we're working with and we can find some projects. Any other questions? Anyone still struggling with some of the concepts or how it might apply at all? So you get some ideas at least. My, my, my goal would be get the data and then make some, just make some graphs. There's a lot you can learn from just a graph. Don't worry about the statistics right away. Statistics will come <laughs> later, but you'll see some really interesting things in the, in the graphs of the data. Just plot it out, look at simple numbers, just getting that data and doing something with it is you're gonna learn a lot right there. And that doesn't require you have to go through weeks of training. So what's your education? Statistics or data analysis yes. or what? I have a statistics bachelor. Okay. And so when I got out of school, I didn't know about Six Sigma very much. And that was starting to pick up. And I looked at the curriculum, I'm like, well, this is just basically what I just learned in school. So yeah. that was a nice fit. A lot of people, though, don't have a statistics background, but they, as they're applying it to real world problems, they're seeing that, oh, the statistics is actually useful. I didn't know what I'd use it for, now I do. So. So what's the difference between that and data analytics? Because I'm thinking, I'm gonna learn lean, but you know, I'm gonna use my analytics people for the depth of the Six Sigma, Sigma yeah. stuff. I would say that the data analytics people probably have some background right. without realizing it. 
but they might do also be doing a lot of higher level visual graphics charts and stuff like that too mm -hmm. that may not get into heavy statistics or analysis they might not get into is this group a statistical difference between this other group they might just see this one's higher or less than the other so i haven't really dug too much into the like data mining data now analytics stuff but there is probably some a lot of overlap Seems like this could be a structure for them. Yep. Yes. Thank so. you very much. And then any feedback you have around this workshop, highly appreciate it. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of time on one of the exercises, but um, we did get through one of them, so I'm just good about that. Um, so yeah, anything else you have feedback on? I'll send out a little survey. I think that's just easier. Um, let's, yeah, let's just do that. And then if you don't have your email and you want me to get you included, make sure I've got it. If you signed up through Eventbrite, then I've got it. Okay, anything else? Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank